Let's learn everything that you need to know about Crutzfeld Jakob disease. So CJD refers to a fatal, rapidly neurodegenerative disease that is due to misfolded prion proteins. CJD is the most common prion disease in humans. It's considered technically a trans transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. It can be subdivided into a couple different types. Sporadic type is the most common. It accounts for about 85% of all cases. In the sporadic type, there's no known cause. There's familial type, which is somewhere around 14 to maybe 15% of all cases. This is due to a mutation in the PRNP gene that causes glutamic acid to get replaced by lysine. And then that leads to formation of misfolded prions, which we'll talk about in pathophysiology. And then lastly, there is the acquired subtype, um, not really relevant for the purposes of exams, but just kind of an interesting aside. Acquired is when there's things like a contaminated uh, a piece of equipment in certain surgical procedures. So this has historically been associated with things like corneal transplants, for example. So the big, the big thing to take away from CJD is the pathophysiology here. So normally there are prions, um, they get encoded by the gene. I mentioned them on the last slide. It's the PRNP gene and they exist in alpha helical configurations. These are found on the membranes or I guess the surfaces for the purposes of this illustration of cortical neurons. And so what happens here is that when the protein, when the prion gets misfolded and it goes from being mostly alpha helical to being beta pleated, then that is where the problem arises. So there's this misfolded protein now that should be alpha helical, but now it's in beta pleated sheets. And when it does that, it leads to a host of problems. So your normal prions, which are alpha helical shown in orange, get changed into more beta pleated shown in green. This makes the prions insoluble. And when they're insoluble, they are resistant to proteases. So in other words, they can't be broken down. And so if they can't be broken down, then what happens is they induce even more conformational changes in the normal, more alpha helical prions into these abnormally folded beta pleated sheets. And what happens is it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy here. You get more accumulation and more self-propagation of these misfolded proteins. And over time, that leads to plaque formation, vacuolization, and ultimately cell death. So for this reason, this is why this is sometimes referred to as a spongiform encephalopathy, because as the cell death occurs and as that vacuolization occurs, it leads to neuronal cell death. But when you physically look at a specimen or histopathological image of the brain tissue, you see vacuolization and it looks spongiform. That's where that word comes from. So bottom line here, the problem is that alpha helical proteins get turned into beta pleated proteins, which causes even more conformational change, self-propagation, plaque formation, vacuolization, and cell death. So not super complex, but definitely worth knowing. Clinically, this is how they're gonna give it to you on exams. They're gonna throw out some buzzwords and expect you to identify that this is CJD. So the most important thing, I'm actually gonna to jump to the third item listed here, rapidly progressive dementia. So this is really, really important because when they give it to you on an exam, they're going to give you a patient who has these symptoms that are dementia related symptoms, but they're, they started like a week ago, two weeks ago at the most, it's going to be within zero to two weeks, as opposed to something like Alzheimer's dementia, where obviously that presentation is going to evolve over a longer period of time. Now, going back up to the top, we see things like cerebellar dysfunction, myoclonus. This is a big one, and this is sometimes referred to as startle myoclonus. So what startle myoclonus refers to is that some startling stimulus will put the patient into a state of myoclonus, which is those involuntary brief muscle twitches. And then at the bottom here, we see neuropsychiatric symptoms. There's a host of them. Things like visual hallucinations, akinetic mutism, personality changes, seizures, sleep disorders, ataxia really should be at the top with cerebellar dysfunction, and dysautonomia. So all of these things together are the clinical features of CJD. And the mnemonic to memorize this is 
surprise, CJD. C for cerebellar dysfunction, J for jerkiness, which is my way of memorizing myoclonus because myoclonus is, again, sort of those brief, um, almost shock-like muscle twitches, and they are uh, startle myoclonus in, in the case of CJD. Um, but J for jerkiness and then D for dementia, specifically rapidly progressive. So CJD, cerebellar, jerking, and dementia. That kind of helps me remember exactly what goes into CJD. But on your exam, the test writer is not going to tell you it's rapidly progressive dementia. Med students have this really bad habit of being like, all right, I'm not really going to memorize crutzfeld jakob disease. I'm just going to memorize if I see rapidly progressive dementia, that equals CJD. But the test writer is not going to say, hey, this is rapidly progressive dementia. They're going to give you like a 60-ish year old patient who has dementia symptoms that started one week ago. Maybe they give you some other buzzwords, but you need to put two and two together to identify that this is rapidly progressive. So I really wouldn't count on that being in your vignette. I mean, they'll tell you when it started, but you're looking for things like the myoclonus, the ataxia, and then a couple other buzzwords, which I will mention now. So on the EEG, you see triphasic periodic sharp wave complexes. And I'm not even gonna bother to show you what these look like because you are you don't need to know what it looks like. But if you see a picture of an EEG and it's given to you in the context of somebody with myoclonus, you can just assume, if you wanna take a guess and not commit any more brain space to this, that they're going after CJD. Um, these tend to be like one to two hertz. You, again, not you don't need to know that, but I just point that out because if they include one to two hertz in the vignette, they're pushing you in the direction of CJD. Histopathologically, I already mentioned this, but you're looking at those intra, you're looking for those intracytoplasmic vacuoles within the neurons. And again, that's termed spongiform because of that vacuolation or vacualization. I really struggled to say that word uh, as the neurons die. And now when we think about the EEG findings, I told you that the mnemonic is CJD. CJD is three letters and tri equals three. So triphasic sharp wave complexes, tri equals three. There's three letters in CJD. So when I see triphasic, I'm always like, wait, which, which is the neurological disease that means three? CJD, and I'm done. CSF findings are also really important. Um, the, the big one is 1433 protein. So elevated 1433 in the CSF, that is a signal of neuron death and, and cell destruction. And so that's why that's elevated in patients with CJD. So if you see increased 1433, that is a stop, do not pass go, select CJD as your answer type of situation here. Um, but sometimes the test writer will be a real jerk and they won't give you that. And they'll instead say S100 protein or tau protein or protein specific enolase. Sometimes they'll write neuron specific enolase. It means the same thing. But 1433, that is a dead giveaway for CJD. And I told you the mnemonic is CJD. CJD has how many letters, guys and girls? Three. And you see in 1433, there's a lot of threes. So 1433 equals three. What has three? CJD. I feel like I'm reading a Dr. Seuss book here to you, but there you go. So CJD, really, really important. It will get differentiated on your exam against some other disease processes where you see either dementia, although that typically won't show up because it's really easy to know like this dementia has been getting worse over the past six to 12 months versus this one in the case of CJD has been like zero to two weeks. So usually where the test writer will go is they'll go after a differential that includes myoclonus. So you think about what other disease processes or what other uh, syndromes will cause myoclonus. So you want to be thinking, of course, of, of CJD in this case, but also about things like subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, some types of viral encephalitides, um, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and then some other, you know, like um, serotonin syndrome, for example. So anything that can cause myoclonus, you want to put this in your differential and ask yourself, what would the test writer need to give me to make me think that this was CJD instead of one of those other things that I just mentioned? Lastly, I didn't bother to do a, a slide on treatment because unfortunately there's no cure or treatment for CJD. Usually if somebody's diagnosed with this, they die within about the, the following year. So 
current treatment guidelines really are just supportive treatment and usually um, palliative measures. So that's CJD. Just remember the mnemonic CJD, which means three. So if you see three, it's CJD.